to move on to our next uh, speaker, and I'm really pleased to say that Professor Luciana Floridi joins us, who is a professor of philosophy and ethics of information at the University of Oxford, and also the director of Digital Ethics Lab. Now, Luciano has worked closely on digital ethics with the European Commission, the German Ethics Council, and in the UK with the House of Lords and the Cabinet Office. Currently, he's a member of the EU's Ethics Advisory Group and the chairman of the Ethics Advisory Board of the European Medical Information Framework. Uh, using his vast experience, Luciano is gonna to talk to us now about how we define new ethics in this digital age, which includes the benefits of technology for society and also for the economy whilst reinforcing the rights and freedoms of individuals. Can't think of a better person to do that. Please welcome Professor Luciano Floridi to the stage. That was a long introduction. <laughs> well, um Good morning uh, to all of you who are quiet and to those of you who are still talking down there. It would be easy to give you a really, really boring and depressing talk in the next 14 minutes and a half um, because, um, in general, optimism is an acquired taste. If you are intelligent, you shouldn't be optimistic. You look at the world and you can see that the world is going from bad to worse and you conclude that there is no reason for being optimistic. The reason that some people like myself find, despite not being average intelligent, to be optimistic is that um, you take a longer term view. You look at the world and say, well, look, uh, yes, there are steps back, but there are two steps forward. If for every two steps, there's one back, two forward, one back, so we are improving somewhat. The question that we have to, for today, uh, is AI a force for good, is, is this a, one of the steps forward or is one of the spe steps back? So I'd like to talk to you about this as a step forward if we take the right measures. So at the end of the few minutes we, together, what was the message? Optimism is an acquired taste. So what I'm going to tell you uh, about is um, uh, something that is based on the idea that uh, um, we have detached the ability to solve problems, agency, from the need of being intelligent. That's why my iPhone plays chess better than me. It doesn't have to be intelligent. I know that this is not what you get from the tabloid. I know that you probably didn't get that from the course on, on AI. But uh, assume for a moment that that is the case. So agency, the ability to solve problems successfully, doesn't have to be intelligent to do so. That's why we are succeeding in developing our AI. Well, the next step is, uh, so how, how come that this is actually the case? How detaching intelligence from agency works? Well, because we made the world friendly to these machines. We don't have robots that not take my seat and drive the car instead of me. We have cars that are in an environment such that that car fits that environment. Otherwise, you're still stuck with some kind of a Star Trek idea of AI. So lower cost, more computation, more data, better machine learning, better algorithm, more internet of things, more on life, that's where we all are. And all of a sudden, those things work pretty well. Well, because the environment has been made friendly to the machines in question. Now, from that perspective, the question then becomes, so what happens? Two points. You detach intelligence from agency, and you make the world friendly to this intelligent, less successful agency. Well, surely this is a new piece on the board. What kind of consequences does it have? I, right there, you know, big enough, um, reservoir of agency for a reason. Sometimes you go to conferences and they ask you the usual question, oh, uh, what should we do about AI? Remember, that is like asking, what should we do about electricity? Like, it's too vague. It, it's meaningless. So what do you mean? I mean, electricity for, you know, for in that case, in this case. So uh, we're not going to transform this into a lecture, trust me. But please do not ask empty questions 
because they generate only messy answers. So if it is a reservoir or smart agency as a resource, like a tab, where do I throw this smart agency? What can I do with it? Well, this is not the problem. You heard this before, so I won't stop here. But bad robot is not coming ever. Do not listen to people say, no yet. No yet means, oh, uh -huh. so I should be worried. OK? Oh, imagine someone tells you, oh, zombies are not coming yet. Like, seriously? <laughs> no yet or never? As far as we know, to the best of our understanding, computer science, etc., this is not a trajectory that is ever going to encounter anything like Skynet. OK? So this is not anything else but an irresponsible distraction. Distraction because it's like the little kid. Look at the keys. Do, 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 do. Meanwhile, the world is going bananas. Irresponsible because the world is going bananas. So we should concentrate on the real stuff. And what's the real stuff? So this is what happens if you use AI properly. Uh, I won't read it for you. Uh, it's big enough for everyone. Uh, but it's, a, it's good use of AI. That's the default position, by the way. Uh, technologies are always loaded, but some are loaded in the positive way and some loaded in a negative way. This stuff has been created to make a positive difference to our life. This is what happens if you misuse or overuse AI. Oh, yeah. That's not good. I mean, it's not good for chocolate. Why should it be good for AI? Too much chocolate? No, thank you. Too much AI? No, thank you either. But there's also another problem. This is what happens if you underuse AI. You miss opportunities, and that's ir irresponsible. Uh, the whole world of uh, health and care at the moment is underusing AI for fear of making a mistake, a sin as any other. So what can we do about these kind of uh, issues? And I'll give you five challenges, and um, I'll leave to you how you want to go with this. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to make sure that AI works against wrongdoing. Meaning, meaning that AI, together with digital technologies, have had this wonderful um, ability to make anybody vulnerable. So at least they, they're leveling the play field. Now, if you have had your data stolen because you had bought a ticket from British uh, Airways, it doesn't matter whether it was first class or the economy. You're still screwed. So at least at that point, we're all on the same boat. That vulnerability needs to be protected. AI can be there for that particular purpose. Make AI, AI enhance human decision and control. Why? Because the world is getting complicated. Uh, what you see there is just the, one of the many statistics about how many people are going to live in immense cities. Who is going to manage those immense cities? And I'm not talking smart. I'm talking huge, complicated. Best scenario, they're going to be smart. Barcelona, Chicago, Rio de Janeiro. Worst scenario, well, I won't mention any other city, but AI will give a hand. That is an ethical sort of pressure that we have to make sure that we use AI for the benefit of everybody. Number three, well, we want to have AI supporting human responsibility. Well, uh, this means, for example, caring. Um, in another context, uh, maybe another time, the green and the blue. That's our chance to make a difference in the world. The green of our economy, our sustainability, etc., with the blue of our digital technologies, AI, the spearhead, they need to work together. Gone are the days when the environment was an enemy of technology, technology was an enemy of the environment. They have to get into a good marriage, or the future is going to be a little bit more difficult for everybody. Number four, it has to work for humanity, not the other way around. Um, after all, it's a sign of intelligence to make stupidity work for you, isn't it? So what does that mean? Here I will stop a little bit longer on this point because there is some misunderstanding. The misunderstanding normally is called work. First of all, once and for all, plan A since we left paradise was not working. So do not get this point about, oh, everybody wants to work. No, everybody wants to have a salary that comes with work. If you can have a salary without working, I'm sure the queue is pretty long. And when I say work, 
don't look at this room, we, but we are the 1%. Look at the other 99. That kind of work. The work that you have to wake up at that time in the morning and go back in the evening at that time. And you can't wait for the weekend. That work, surely no one is going to miss it. But what we will miss is the salary that comes with it. So the narrative about AI, AI is going to destroy, eliminate work, etc. Well, this is what uh, the uh, report about truck drivers says in terms of driverless cars. And I hope you can see uh, in the back uh, the gap between how many truck drivers we need in the United States and how many are available. Someone at some point said, there is no job in truck driving. Driverless cars are coming, seriously. Because a truck driver, that's all he does. From A to B, since when? He opens the gate, fills the paperwork, checks whether the eggs are still OK, because he went boom, boom, no, when he turned the, that particular corner. Make sure that something is going to be OK with the other truck driver. So as we uh, realized at the last Davos, um, it's not jobs that are going, skills are going, but jobs are not a set of skills only. So we are going to miss a lot of truck drivers. Uh, thank you for the rhetoric that uh, AI is going to destroy this industry completely. Uh, it is the same in the car industry. Again, data from the US. You just have to look at the curve. That's where we are back in terms of how many people are employed in the car industry in the United States after the crisis. The point being that the car industry is the most automate, automatized uh, industry in the world, meaning that if a robot could be placed there, has already been placed there a long time ago. Meaning that if the car industry has to develop, whenever there's a new robot, as I was told by one of the major car makers in Germany, uh, dear Luciano, we have to hire another engineer. So no rosy picture, trust me, not from a philosopher ever, you know, you know, not professional rosy picture seller, but a little bit of realism, knowing exactly what the heck are we talking about? Just because you have an intuition that driverless cars, no cab driver, that is rubbish. That's doing Aristotelian physics on intuitions. Well, welcome to Newton. Welcome to Einstein. It doesn't work that way. So that's a mistake. Work is not a pie. It's not that if you take away some of it, there's less for me. There's endless amount of work. The question is where the threshold is when work becomes economically viable. Well, as soon as I get that little robot cut the grass instead of me, I can take care of the roses. That's the idea. Now, no easy ride, no rosy picture, plenty of problems, but can we get the problems right before we run on intuition space on a couple of ideas? And I know that we in Oxford have been hugely responsible for sort of distributing that particular narrative. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's good. But if you do, apologies. Fine point, make us more human. Well, this is important because uh, uh, one thing that AI is doing for us is to undermine our autonomy. You got that little gadget there that tells you nicely, relentlessly, every day, for all your whole life, if you like this, you like that. If you like that, you like that. And maybe you like this more. Uh, who is going to adapt to whom? We need to be a bit careful. Again, there's a nice picture here to uh, enjoy, but make sure that our autonomy is what drives the development of AI, not the other way around. That would be cool. So what can we do about this? And we're coming to the, towards the end. A couple of extra minutes, endure, and stay with me. So we can do a little bit of digital ethics. Meaning, well, ethics normally is do not run with scissors in your hand kind of moment. No? That's what you get as a kid. Don't do this, don't do that. That's fine. But in this field, it's also an enabler. In other words, you speak to big companies and say, look, you can do more and better if only you have that framework. So it's not just about don't do this and don't do that, but it's also you should this, do this, and you should do that. That's what I like to call soft ethics. Now, we, you don't find this around, so uh, Google it, but the difference between soft and hard is the following. Soft ethics is post-compliance. You talk to some, again, big companies and say, oh, but surely the GDPR, and then, yeah, of course. That is the rules of the game. How do you win? Because playing according to the rules is necessary but insufficient. You don't win the game just by playing according to the rules. You're just part of the game. Oh, and what's 
playing to win, that's called ethics. It's what you do over and above within the constraints of compliance, legal, human rights on the other, and feasibility at the bottom. Can be done, doesn't um, do anything against human rights. Is compliant with law? Yes, okay, show me how you win now. That's the kind of soft ethics that we are developing in a variety of contexts, back in London, back in Brussels, what we should be doing. Why? And that's really the end of the last four, few seconds. Um, well, because this soft ethics has a, a kind of a double advantage, no, uh, a two-fold force. On the one hand, uh, you have risk management. If you do the right thing, or you try to do the right thing, at least you can avoid the Cambridge Analytica moment, say, oops, that was expensive, uh, we could have done something better or differently. But you also have an opportunity strategy. In other words, you can grab things and do more than is strictly required and make your customers happy, as in queuing for your service, wanting to be with you. That's the kind of society we should be building. And so uh, what happens to a bit of an assessment? Well, you want to work with feasibility, inevitably. No, nope. you have to be on the blue line. What can I do within my remit, within my uh, kingdom? Well, within that, you definitely want to be sustainable. And then there's a little bit of acceptability. Is this something that people will put up with? But the bottom line, the real sweet point is preferability. That's where we're going to make a difference. So AI as a preferable solution that people will say, yes. A little test. If it breaks, they build it again. If I lose my watch, I'm going to buy it tomorrow. If my iPhone stops working, I'm going to buy it again. If that popcorn machine in my house stops working, I don't care. I didn't need a, a popcorn machine. Hmm? So do they buy it again? Do they want it again? That is the test for preferability. Conclusion, the real challenge, as you might have guessed, is not technological innovation. Everybody in his ankle can do that. Or you buy a startup anyway. It's what we do with it. It's the governance of the digital that is going to be the real challenge for our generation in the for, uh, foreseeable future. What we should be doing is um, think deeper, and not in 15 minutes, trust me. This is just the appetizer. We should be more mindful of what we're doing. We should care more about not just humanity, not human-centric, but planet-centric, for goodness sake. Stop thinking about yourself only. It's not just about humanity. A, a wonderful humanity on a dead planet is not going to survive. And design better, which is the real innovation today. Not invention, not discovery, but design, which is up to us, really. Thank you so much.